afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Fall is definitely here and it means the outdoor gardening season is winding down. Nonetheless, there are still some lawn, garden and landscape chores to be done and some problems to be aware of either now or ones that you want to avoid next year. So for seasonal tips, we turn to our expert UVM horticulturalist Leonard Perry. It's great to see you again. Great to be back, Judy. And so before we get started, I just want our viewers to know that Ann Hazelrig from UVM Plant Diagnostic Clinic was supposed to be with us today, but um, uh, couldn't make it. So we're going to be hearing from her a little bit later. Now, Leonard, you're going to start with some viewer questions that were sent in after last month's That's program. That's right, Judy. We got a couple of questions we wanted to talk about, very timely topics. Uh, we'll start with Karen, okay. who has a poinsettia now. I get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, people want to reboom a poinsettia. How do you do that? Well, um, and she writes that she's been doing the darkness treatment for about a week, but will be away overnight. Um, and is it better to leave the plant in the window or darkness for the extra day? Well, to explain what she's talking about, poinsettias to bloom need at least 13 hours of, uh, 13 to 16 hours of total darkness daily. Total's key. You can't mm -hmm. peek, you um, put it in a closet at night, you can't be opening the door, you can't have light coming in. So total darkness and you need that for about six weeks beginning in early October. So to answer her question, the best thing is probably to leave it in the darkness because if she leaves it out overnight, you know, in the window and it gets light, even for a night, that can help set it back. Oh, really? So it's amazing. It's that dark period that uh, makes a poinsettia rebloom. A lot of people may try that just to say they did it, mm -hmm. to see how it works and you know it won't be probably as nice as the plants you get from the greenhouse growers but uh, but it's it's kind of a fun thing yeah there you go and then we got another question um, here from Mary Ellen Mary Ellen in Rutland um, who said that her husband had made her a raised bed that's three foot high up on metal legs and three foot long and 18 inches wide she's filled it with a mixture of potting soil and compost from her own pile and was wondering if it should be covered over winter or not. Um, well, these are becoming a lot more popular. I know I'll be building one for my wife for next year. I know we have some friends that put one. Mm -hmm. These are kind of the next step with raised beds, pulling them up off the ground. So that being said, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is, you know, they get wet and you got to, if you put them up, have some holes in the bottom for drainage. Yep. And when they get wet, that soil is going to be real heavy. So make sure it's really supported. And she assured me they had extra support on the bottom there. Um, the nice thing about covering it for winter is, uh, then she said, you know, you can just scoop the snow off, which makes sense. Plus it helps keep it from being soaking wet over winter. And when it freezes then it'd be like ice, you know, it'll expand right. and yep. metal that might ruin it over time or, or shorten the life of it. So my advice is, yeah, that um, help you know maybe go on and cover it up and that's um, a, an idea something you can do this fall to get ready for next year or two. That sounds wonderful. Yeah so I think you know race beds and actually I have a couple of pictures that, uh, from one of our tours. This is Pleasant View Gardens down in New Hampshire and we'll mm -hmm. talk about the tours at the end but uh, this is a ultimate kind of raised bed. It is. This is I kind of the home of the proven winners. That's some of the ones they have. You don't have but you can get that idea. You don't have to have this huge long one but just kind of a big window box up on stilts off the ground. I thought that was kind of a neat it's idea. Like a and here's the idea I th think it's not, you, nice. You just get these raised beds. You kind of stack them up. And what I'm thinking of doing is having a couple of these low ones and then in between them have a space and then have one another one uh, kind of straddling those so it's up off the ground so you kind of have that kind of effect but anyway just a neat idea for something different for raised beds if you want to really get creative. That sounds terrific. Well that's a great question about the raised beds and we're going to take a few minutes now to join Ann Hazelrig who tells us about the UVM Plant Diagnostic Clinic and a few tips related to the fall harvest. Here we are in Jeffords Hall. We're in the Plant Diagnostic Clinic, which is a clinic set up for commercial growers, home gardeners, master gardeners, uh, all across the state of Vermont to be able to send in disease, insect, or weed samples. And then we identify what's wrong, and then we make recommendations for control. Um, we get about five or 600 samples a year, but now we get a lot of emails and pictures too, so we're, we're busy. And this is also, my lab is gonna be the future home of the Master Gardener Helpline, so we'll have helpline volunteers in here uh, helping home gardeners identify problems. So uh, I brought in a couple things that we're seeing in the clinic right now. These are fall issues. Uh, the first is a, a butternut squash, and this is actually from my home garden. <laughs> I've got all the diseases, but it's a fungus disease uh, called black rot, and it's a very common problem on this squash. And you sort of see these concentric rings 
where the fungus is invaded, and it also has a foliar and a stem portion too to the disease, but this is what we see at this time of the year. For home gardeners, it's really no problem. Uh, it's perfectly fine to eat. I would just not store these for very long. I would go ahead and cook them, and they're perfectly fine. It's At this point, it's a superficial rot. So eat it early and it's it's all good but it may not store as long as as you'd like it to so that's the black rod on butternut squash this is another one that's uh, come in from the as a picture and it's also out in my garden too it's a buttercup squash and this is a disorder called edema and what it's uh, caused by is fluctuating soil mo moisture which we certainly have had this summer you know on the dry side but then we've gotten a few rains um, so again it doesn't cause any real problems it's perfectly fine to eat it's more of a doesn't look as pretty as as what it should look. This is another issue that I've seen um, coming into the clinic. This is uh, just plain old sunburn, I think, on this acorn squash. Again, no, no problem. Just go ahead and eat it. Some of these may not store as long. So I also have a few slides of, of things we we're going to get calls on. We've gotten a few, but I anticipate a lot of calls on, and that's uh, the home invaders. And I'm not talking about the human kind. <laughs> These are all insects, and there are three different home invaders that we see a lot in Vermont, and it always causes concern among homeowners. Uh, that's the uh, multicolored Asian lady beetle, the western conifer seed bug and the box elder bug. So uh, my first slide of the uh, multicolored Asian uh, lady beetle, this is a little bit larger beetle than our normal ladybug that we see all the time and it can be from yellow to orange in colors and it could have zero to up to 19 spots. Um, and this little lady beetle was actually introduced into the U.S. by the USDA in the 1970s and 80s um, to feed on aphids and scale. But it's really proliferated and it's really not a pest problem, it's actually, it's just a nuisance problem because there are several generations of this insect per year and then right about this time of year when the nights get cold and we still have sunny days, especially on the south side of houses, these beetles congregate and then they try to get into the houses through cracks and crevices to overwinter. And so, uh, and then once they get in your house, another problem with these is that they, if disturbed, they exude this yellow, foul-smelling substance that can also cause spots on your uh, walls or furniture. So I think the first line of defense for these is um, you wanna seal up any cracks and crevices, you know, caulk your windows, uh, make sure your doors shut tightly, just try to exclude them. Don't use an insecticide, it's just, it's not worth it and you certainly don't want to use an insecticide inside the house. Um, the other thing you can do is just vacuum them up. Uh, that's got to be kind of satisfying, so, <laughs> but basically don't use an insecticide. The second pest is this western conifer seed bug and this is a fairly large bug. It's about three quarters of an inch long. Um, kind of an impressive looking insect. Uh, but it feeds on the seeds and developing cones of conifers, so it's really not a, a pest per se, but again, it's a nuisance. Um, they only have one generation per year, but again, like the lady beetles, when it gets cool nights and we still have these warm sunny days, especially on south sides of walls, they congregate and they're gonna try to get into the house too. So same thing goes for these, you know, caulk, try to exclude them, and if they get inside, just pick them up and throw them back outside. They don't bite uh, or vacuum them up. Okay, the third pest kind of works the same way as these other two. It's a, a nuisance. It's called the box elder bug, and it's got this black and or, uh, red coloration. They're kind of pretty bugs, um, but again, they're looking for these fall overwintering sites. So they may get in the house, same thing goes, caulk things, suck them up with a vacuum, and, and don't worry about it. One other problem that uh, I've gotten a few calls on is a um, potato disease called scab, and it's kind of a cross between a fungus and a bacteria. And this has a real corky appearance to the skin of the potato. They don't look so pretty. But uh, again, if you're a home gardener, these make perfectly good mashed potatoes. Just uh, peel off that skin 
and go ahead and cook them. They're just fine to eat. Next year, uh, you might want to rotate the potatoes, but this, this uh, organism is in, the, in all soil. So some years it's worse than others. The other thing you can do for that um, particular problem is look for resistant varieties. If you consistently have that issue, try to find resistant varieties. That's a little bit about the Plant Diagnostic Clinic and what we've been seeing in this early fall time period. Well, many thanks to Anne for those tips. Back here in the studio, I'm with UVM horticulturalist Leonard Perry, and he's brought in some garlic, and he's going to walk us through the process of planting it. I will, uh, Judy. Just after, just a comment, though, I'm really interested to see Anne's uh, bugs here. I've got those first two, mm -hmm. and I've got a vacuum, one of those handheld ones. I'd have by the window, the <laughs> south window, just to vacuum them up when they get thick, you know, and, and the potatoes, too. I, I did try a couple of resistant varieties, and that mm -hmm. does work on those, so if you have that scab, look for those. But uh, garlic is one of our favorite crops we grow, and I brought a couple uh, samples of things. This is something new I tried this year. This is a garlic ice cube, basically. Ah. And so when I'm cooking, I run out of time to, you know, chop it up, and I want to use some garlic. So I figured, well, how about, is there some way I can get it you know, store it ahead of time. Well, there is. You chop it all up, a whole bunch, put it in ice cube trays with good olive oil. So that's what I did here. So that's an ice cube of olive oil and garlic. So that's, that's just ready to be tossed clove, in a pan? That is. One clove of garlic. It melts very easy. Just put it in the pan. It just melts down. You've got your garlic ready to go. So I've got those in the freezer so I can just pop it in when I want some garlic. A really easy way to do that. And it smells wonderful. Oh, it's really <laughs> smelling good. So I've uh, got to go home and make some garlic now. <laughs> but to plant garlic, it's very easy crop to grow. You buy a bulb. Now this is something you don't get in the su supermarket. You want to get what's called seed garlic, mm -hmm. this bulb, and it has these individual cloves here. And these, uh, you can see very fat, you want ones with the fat cloves. These cloves, individual segments, are what you plant about this time of year. Okay. And it's a cold over winter, it comes up in the spring, makes the plant, and then you harvest it in July. That's basically in a nutshell. So add some good compost to the soil um, around the, this time or after the first frost. Plant these cloves. Again, don't use the supermarket garlic. It's different varieties. It may be treated so it won't sprout. Um, you want to get the seed garlic. A lot of garden stores have that. You separate these cloves like we've done here and planted four inches apart and about two inches deep pointed side up and then you put some mulch on about six inches of straw mm -hmm. it helps moderate the temperatures keeps it warmer in the fall so they uh, start to root a bit but this is a clove you plant it like so uh, pointed side up uh, four inches apart and two inches deep below the soil and um, it's amazing that this will grow next year one of these and then you harvest them dry them and and have garlic to eat. Sounds good. Now you also brought in some gardening tools. I did. I brought some uh, things to show about bulbs. Uh, now is the time to plant mm -hmm. your spring bulbs. So there are a couple things. Now if, you know, if you like power tools, <laughs> this is an serious. auger. This is a serious thing. I don't have much luck with this. So you put on a power drill and it goes down, makes a nice hole. You pull it up. If it's sandy, then the soil is going to fall in. If it's rocky, then it's going to bounce around. Um, so I tend not to use that. I use either a hand unit, and this is a very different one because it's articulated. You push on the top, push it in, and you can see the bottom opens up. Oh, okay. So the whole idea is you push it in, pull it out and have soil, you put the bulb in, and then when it's done, you just open it up and the soil falls back in. Oh, wow. So, and then I have one uh, that I actually use more. This is the handheld one. <laughs> and this is serious. <laughs> this is a serious one, but it, it, you basically step on it. So the same thing. It's got the business end here. You push it in with your foot this mm -hmm. time, pull it up, put the bulb in, and then you just pull the trigger at the top, oh. and you can see it opens right up. And so, um, and then there's this, some measurements too on the side yeah, of how deep so you're it going. So shows you how deep you're going. Yeah. So this is just one of my favorite tools, and I can plant bulbs three to four times as fast with that, and a lot of them. And, um, so I put in a lot of daffodils. Deer don't like daffodils, so and, that, and we've got deer, so that hits. <laughs> I started planting years ago and have many daffodils now. But and there are all kinds of tips on your website as there well. There are a lot of more interested. tips on yep. bulbs or tips on you know growing garlic. There's um, just you know tips uh, that I do with Charlie Nardozzi each month. So mm -hmm. We post on the article section at perrysperennials.info and garden tours. Um, yeah, you've got those. some tours coming up. I do have this next year. We're working on those. So if you want to get on the list, uh, you can just uh, email uh, me at the address there, uh, leonard.perry at uvm.edu. I'll put you 
on the list to get the first notice of these tours. We have a shopping trip in May and a couple uh, probably in May. Uh, in, uh, in June, we'll mm -hmm. probably go to Maine and then Pennsylvania in July. And then, of course, Montreal in September. So um, if you want to get on those lists to hear about those, just send me an email. They're popular tours. They are. They fill up fast. All right. Well, Leonard, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.